All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Johnson. I'm from St. Cloud State University in the state of Minnesota in the United States. I am the director of the new Center for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy with my colleague, Dr. Amy Knopf, who regretfully couldn't make it here today. Today, we are celebrating women. We are celebrating women with disabilities, and specifically, three young emerging leaders in the disability community. One of them is online. Her name is Xiao Rong Jo, and she is a visiting scholar at St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. And I'd like to check with my technicians. Can Xiao Rong be on at the same time as the International Sign Language Interpreter, please? Is that possible? Perfect, thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, Xiao Rong, you can see? Yes. Oh, wait, wait, I'll, I'll just say. So Xiao Rong Zhou is a visiting scholar at St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. Actually, yes? um, no, we can't see correctly. We see half of the American Sign Language Interpreter, an elbow of the International Sign Language Interpreter, and Xiao Rong. So she can't see the interpretation of either one. Okay. So, well, um, 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 um. okay. So, Xiaorang, let's, yeah, does it work if you move over? Don, can you move your chair over to do half of your screen or move back? Oh. Sorry, everyone, technical difficulties. That's actually whatever. That's on better. There now is worse. No, it's worse. No? No, okay. she's actually very big, but she can't see me interpret. Okay, we're working on it. Okay, so I'm going to let the technicians work on that, and uh, we will then introduce our other colleagues here. I have Shandi Danda from uh, the UK, and she is a new colleague who have via the magic of LinkedIn. I invite you all to connect with her on LinkedIn. She's amazing. And then we have Fatma al Jisman, and she is from Dubai, where I met her in Dubai at the Dubai Expo, where we celebrated the UN International Day for Persons with Disabilities and held a summit on women with disabilities. So of course, we invited her here to Vienna today. And then the co-moderator, I'll let you introduce yourself, Ms. Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi. I'm a white female and the founder of Respectability, and I cannot wait to hear from these three superstar young women who are paving the future for us all. So the way our panel will be set up today, I have three questions for each panelist. The first question will start and they will all respond, and then I'll proceed with the second and the third. And then Jennifer will provide some feedback on these emerging young leaders in the field of disability advocacy. Our first question, Shani, if you could respond, please. With, your, do, with respect to the country and context and culture where you come from, could you please share with us what are some of the most challenging issues confronting people with disabilities and specifically women with disabilities and from, from your lens as a woman who's in the minority in the UK? Sure, thank you. I'm from the UK and there are around 14.1 million disabled people. So that's around 22% of the population. It's a challenging time right now to be a disabled person in the UK. Um, sadly, nearly half of everyone that lives in poverty in the UK identifies as either being disabled or lives with a disabled family member. And we know that in the last 10 years, one million more disabled people are, are now living in poverty. In addition to that, Disabled people are twice as likely to be unemployed and have to apply for 60% more jobs when there are over 1 million disabled people that can and want to work. It seems like there is just layer and layer and layers of multiple inequalities and marginalization. I myself am a South Asian woman who experiences disability and when you have multiple identities the oppression and the marginalization all compounds itself. And intersectionality can help us to understand that. So in any given situation, I'll never know if somebody is discriminating me on the basis of my gender, my race, 
or the fact that I have a very visible condition. It may be a consequence of all three or perhaps one or two of my identities, depending on the bias that people have. So there are some really significant challenges facing disabled people um, in the United Kingdom. And again, sadly, just a few weeks ago, our national disability strategy was ruled as unlawful. So we have a really long way to go working with our current government to ensure that they are really understanding the needs of disabled people and the challenges that we are facing. Okay, thank you so much. And your future is very bright as a disability advocate, knowing a solid understanding of your challenges and working to change those. Next, Fatma, please could you share and introduce a little bit more about yourself, Fatma? Hello, my name is Fatma al -Jassim. I'm from the United Arab Emirates, and um, I, I work as a disability consultant uh, in the sphere of uh, policy making and um, uh, inclusive, inclusive projects as well. Um, for me personally, uh, coming from a very young country, uh, I can see challenges uh, turning into possibilities or opportunities. Um, the UAE is very young and, uh, and it uh, has leaped through uh, the disability sphere coming from the Arab world. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, but at the same time, uh, we can see them as opportunities as well. Uh, looking at challenges, I would say that they're uh, similar to what uh, Shani ex explained in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of challenges. They're the global challenges of accessibility, of, uh, uh, of having assistive technologies which are available in, in our native languages as well. Uh, and as in Arabic, because um, the earlier panel, for example, uh, talked about uh, artificial intelligence, and the um, and the other day, yesterday, uh, they talked about big uh, big tech companies and uh, and AI, and I want uh, I'm from this platform, I want to uh, share uh, that. It's important to also have uh, assistive technologies and, and AI and devices that are, uh, that are inclusive in terms of uh, non-English speakers or um, for, uh, for, um, for other regions of, in the world. As well, I, I could add to what uh, Shani said in terms of intersectionality. Um, I, uh, th uh, I believe that in, in the Arab world um, or in the world in general, uh, there are um, efforts done, but uh, they're in isolation. And, and what we need to do is that we need to unify the efforts in terms of um, not, not being able to work as alone, uh, alone as disability advocates or as organizations and def um, uh, really help uh, in terms of advancing those, uh, this agenda together. Uh, I feel like um, there's been a lot of efforts, but they're, they're um, very, in uh, very uh, individualized and, uh, and very, uh, scattered mm. uh, in, in the world in general. And the, uh, the platform as Zero Project gives us uh, a great opportunity to come together, not, not only to share our experiences, but also to work together uh, com going forward. Thank you. Excellent, Fatma, thank you. And we look forward to your bright future too. Next, um, colleagues, are we able to get Xiaorong on? Okay, please, Xiaorong, could you share from your perspective in China, um, and specifically if you can focus on the deaf, 
the challenges that confront the deaf community in China. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. My name is Xiao Rong. And I have a master's degree related to linguistics from South Korea. And I'm currently working as a researcher at St. Cloud State University, a visiting scholar. And I'm looking at Chinese sign language curriculum development. And we're trying to figure out how to set up a curriculum so that it can a teaching method can be developed for Chinese sign language. And of course, I'm also involved in leadership activities for deaf people and um, interacting with a lot of different people on, in the disability sphere. There are many challenges in China, but the biggest challenge is the access to education. There's basically, um, there are two main majors that deaf people can have in college, either art or computers, and there's no other options beyond that. So many people might go to school who are deaf and get a bachelor's degree in one of those two areas, but they can't go beyond that. They couldn't become a doctor or an engineer or anything of that sort because there's only one master's degree that's even available for deaf people. Um, and it's basically because the people in China believe that de deaf people and disabled people in general can't achieve at that level. We also have a big issue with unqualified interpreters, not having enough of, of interpreters. There's no licensing or um, certification of interpreters. And if I, as a deaf woman was pregnant and um, I needed to go to the doctor, I'd have to have my parents come with me and try to help interpret for me. I would have no sign language interpreter at the doctor. So I have no self-determination in a situation like that. Basically, my parents would end up deciding everything about what would happen with my own pregnancy. So imagine. And, you know, there are many ways that we can face this, these issues. Um, but the biggest thing is that there needs to be more education for deaf people and in any topic, not just in the two areas that they're allowed to study at this point. Um, and there's another issue too. We don't want decisions made about us without us. That's one of our, our big themes that we keep coming up with. You know, um, like menstruation for women, it's a, you know, there's a, that's, that's a kind of issue that only women know so much about and they should be able to make decisions about that. Um, it's the same idea with deaf people. We know what it is like to be a deaf person and what our needs are. And so we need to have that self-determination and we need to be respected as an independent culture too of people. And people should be able to respect us for who we are and let us make our own decisions. They can, they could be a part of our community and work with us as peers, but we don't want other people making decisions for us. Okay, excellent. Xiaorang, one second. We're gonna go on to the next question, okay? She could talk all day. <laughs> and, and I love working with you, Sharang. Thank you. Okay, so we've heard from each of our three panelists what are some of the major obstacles and challenges that confront them as young women leaders uh, in their communities. And now we'd like to hear, what are your hopes? What big hopes do you have for the future? This time I'm going to start with Fatma. Is that all right, Fatma? Um. But before I answer this question, let me ask you a question, a question for the audience, uh, either virtually or here in the room. Um, what brought you here? What brought you here? Uh, what's the purpose of uh, having, um, um, being a participant in this conference for you? 
Um, is it is it the fact that we have a common goal uh, as uh, the disability community, or is it that we um, when, uh, face the same challenges? For me personally, the way I see it is that we are joined by hope, hope for a better future for all, uh, no matter where we live in. Um, and to begin to answer your question, um, I want you to imagine uh, uh, being in a forest, uh, in the middle of a forest, and uh, and lost and, uh, without anything help to help you to navigate. Uh, sometimes having a disability or being a, per a person with a disability or um, a family uh, or a member uh, of a family member or sibling of a person with a disability feels like it sometimes. It feels like uh, you don't have a roadmap. You don't have a, a something to to uh, navigate uh, your life with. And from from here, um, what I want to say is that our job is to hopefully build that construct that compass together, that compass uh, that helps future generations to to access uh, uh, endless opportunities uh, the same way as other non-disabled people access them. Um, and it's important to, to note that uh, in that hope, uh, I hope that uh, there's a lot of our, our research and development uh, in the intersectionality aspect of disability. It means uh, treating, the, uh, treating uh, the, the subject matter of disability as not a special matter, uh, but as a focal point uh, in every conversation um, that we have in the future. And one of the main um, things I hope uh, in the future to, to see is to see leaders uh, with disabilities uh, leading the way uh, and and building together uh, uh, for, for a continuum of an accessible and inclusive community. Uh, it's often that we are, are as disabled women and and people in general uh, are, pet, are put in a back seat uh, and consulted uh, uh, or, or uh, asked to give our opinion or information, uh, our feedback on products, uh, um, on products and policies rather than being in the forefront and leading the way. Um, and I hope I answered your question. You answered it beautifully. And I know that there will be women at the table with disabilities in decision-making modes in the UAE with your bright future. All right, Shani, could you share your hopes for the future? A couple minutes. Initially, I thought this was a really hard question, especially with how the current landscape is in the UK. But it's really important to talk about hope because we always need hope. And when you asked me about the challenges, I only scratched the surface. I didn't even talk about the extra cost disabled people face, the lack of accessible housing, the inaccessible transport. But, but as I said, hope's really important. And women faced so many more layers of marginalization. Um, and the way, in which, uh, the way that I look at it is actually through the lens of irony. So I find it so ironic that I've been asked that if I've been asked if I'm pregnant more times by medical professionals because that's their job than the amount of times I've ever been included in conversations about sex, dating, marriage, uh, relationships, or having kids. I think I must be the only South Asian woman who's never been pressured to get married, and 
my, you know, <laughs> marriage is very intrinsic in the South Asian community. So my hope is that we treat and respect disabled people as equal and valued members of society with, with equal rights and responsibilities as everybody else. That's my hope. I feel like we're very far off it right now. It kind of feels like one step forward, 10 steps back in the UK. Um, and there's, there's great people doing great things, um, but that, that's my hope. Great, and the next question you'll be able to then address how you're gonna solve. Okay, can we bring Xiaorong back on? Xiaorong, if you could please share, what's your hope for the future for people who are deaf in China? Yes, absolutely. I'm really hoping for more education for deaf people and a better quality of interpreters. Those are my two of my biggest things. And I really want there to be equality between hearing and deaf people. I want to feel like equal to, that's my hope. One woman that I um, had talked to said, um, you know, you should, her parents told her, you should just go ahead and get married and don't worry about your education. And you know, basically she was deprived of her education because her parents just thought that she didn't need it, that she would be fine without it because she had less ability anyway. So really my hope is that women have rights and that women who are deaf in China have rights and that we have access to equal education and, and to have more global skills too, um, to understand how to interact with the global um, deaf community and be able to just be themselves. That's really what people want is equal rights and to be able to be themselves. Excellent. Thank you. Xiaorong will let you lead. Oops, <laughs> since you're on, if you could bring Xiaorong on, she'll start with this question. So the last question that we have for our panelists before we hear from Jennifer is we talked about the challenges, we talked about the hopes, so please, could you provide some advice to the leaders in your countries? What are some next steps to bridge that gap between the challenges and the hope that you have to bring and narrow that gap? Xiaorong, if you could start, please. What needs to happen in China to bridge the gaps? Um, yeah, that's the big challenge for me to think of what changes exactly need to happen. Um, as a Chinese female who's also deaf, you know, China is um, a, a difficult place to be because we're basically told what to do. Um, I, I think it really centers around education, like I said before, if that would be opened up to deaf people um, if they had that and if they were able to have more exposure to the international deaf community, those would be two key points. Um, and we really want um, there to be some kind of mechanism so that um, leadership could be carried on and taught to the younger generations, because um, that's something that's really important as well. And with um, Chinese Sign Language, we've been working on the curriculum, and I really think that needs to be solved too. We have to have a good Chinese Sign Language and um, curriculum before we can actually build good, signing, good Chinese Sign Language interpreters and build their skills. Um, you know, I think a lot of deaf people would uh, do better if they came to America to study and be exposed to um, some broader ideas and um, to have more awareness of what's really out there and what's really possible. And they could come back to China and really um, spread that information around. Um, there are many deaf leaders in America and um, even a lot of deaf people who have master's degrees and PhDs and are instructors in universities. And as I've been to exposed to that, I realized that's one of the pieces that really needs to happen 
is that other people need to have that exposure and see that there's so many possibilities. They need to bring that back to China and then that can spread out from there. Excellent, Xiaorong. We're so honored to have you as a visiting scholar and I know you'll bring that knowledge back to China upon your return. You'll be part of that change. Wonderful. Shani, please. I think any approach to solving this or looking at how we improve the situation has to be intersectional. I think in the UK, we, we, we are in a fortunate position where we understand what exclusion looks like for disabled people. We have okay data, but then many approaches on intersectional, and intersectionality is really important. Let's take, for example, the disability pay gap. We know that disabled people work effectively two months of the year for free because the pay gap is so big. But then if you also then identify as a woman or on top of that, perhaps as someone from an ethnic minority, the, the, the pay gap is even wider. So that's why solutions need to be intersectional to really understand the level of inequality that's being faced by the whole diverse range of disabled people that are out there. And my message to disabled people is, is we are stronger when we are together. Use the power that you have, whether that's through social media, through your local communities, and you use your voice to create the change that you want to. I did that through creating platforms such as the Asian Woman Festival and the Asian Disability Network, because those were the things that I wish existed when I was growing up. So I think it's about reclaiming that power as well. Excellent. And if you get a chance, if you can visit her website, I highly recommend it. Uh, you'll see where she has learned how to be a social media influencer. Excellent. Fatma, if you could share what needs to happen in the UAE, in the Middle East, where you're leading the change. Um, I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most important areas uh, uh, in our region uh, that needs to be addressed is um, data where when we uh, when we want to build an ecosystem that responds to uh, the needs of disabled people in the region um, th that needs to be built based on data and uh, that data has to be a fundamental point that uh, that, re uh, that research has has to be embodied in the systems uh, that can help in that first of all this the second point would be uh, developing capacity building and skills and and the uh, advocates themselves and have, uh, have, have to have the platform where they can develop their skills and get to, uh, get to know more about um, how to advocate for themselves as the first as the first point uh, th uh, my third uh, suggestion would be um, would be uh, in terms of um, intersectionality, it's important to think of the person with a disability from uh, from a point of view that's that's not vertical, that's horizontal in terms of across all uh, all sectors in terms of being able to. Um, being able to provide services and support systems from day one till uh, to, uh, from their very at the very young age till uh, their uh, their older persons, we need to remember that uh, uh, disability is a lifelong uh, spectrum for um, the majority of the uh, of uh, of the uh, of the people. And um, and as well, uh, if we think about the 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 theme as uh, zero barriers in the future, as the zero conference or the zero project, uh, we need to think about 
forecasting or foresighting the disability sector. And that does not happen without uh, having uh, holistic and comprehensive data. Well said, Fatma. Fatma also has a web page that I encourage you to uh, visit, uh, Empowerment, and yes, and you can find her on LinkedIn too. Next, we would like to, could we bring Xiaorong back on so I can see her? Thank you. Then we will uh, invite Jennifer, please. Uh, Jennifer and I are about the same age, and so I invited her to this panel to share words of wisdom to these younger women emerging in the field of disability advocacy as women with disability. Jennifer? So I'm just so thrilled to be with the next generation of leaders. Uh, I am 57 years old, and I am dyslexic, and I have ADHD. And when I was a child, they did not know what dyslexia was. And so there wasn't special education to help me learn how to read. And I didn't learn or start to learn until I was 12. I stopped growing when I was 12, so I was already 5 foot 10. And when I was in college, I was run over by a car, and I used a wheelchair, like one of my colleagues on the panel, and it was before the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, so absolutely nothing was accessible. So it's really remarkable to see how much has changed in a relatively short period of time. Not so long ago, if you had a panel of women talking about disability, you would have had mothers of people with disabilities, and you would not have had people with disabilities themselves. And in fact, in the United States, almost all national disability groups were founded by white two-parent families who have a child with one particular disability or another. The work was done by the mothers. There was almost no space for the people of color, almost no space for the self-advocate. Thankfully, that is changing, and we heard from each of our panelists how important intersectionality is. And I really believe that the future must be intersectional, that we must come together across race, gender, the different kinds of disabilities that everyone is living with. Another profound change that we see with this panelist is that none of them is in the business of just keeping their own nose above water as a person with a disability, just trying to help themselves. Each of them is creating a paradigm shift, not only for people with disabilities, but for their non-disabled peers. So Shani is a expert consultant helping top-tier corporations and organizations across Europe learn how to benefit from the talents of people with disabilities, not just so that the people with disabilities can have the opportunity, but also so that everyone without disabilities can benefit from their talents. It's extraordinary to see what Fatma is doing in the Middle East as literally the first in history accessibility consultant who is fully certified in her region and country as she is breaking barriers that will unlock talent and potential for so many. Her neighborhood where she lives is at crucial crisis to climate change. As we look at the issue of natural disasters and climate change, autistic activist Greta Thunberg is at the forefront. Innovator Elon Musk, who also is on the autism spectrum and has bipolar disorder, also is on the forefront of dealing with climate change. There are many geniuses and innovators in the Middle East whose talents have not yet been unlocked. We heard from China about all the talented people who were deaf who were told that you only get two career choices. You can either study computers or you can study deafness.
but you can't be a doctor or a scientist or any other kind of innovator. This is a country of 1.2 billion people where one out of every four adults has one form of disability or another. Ironically, one of the benefits of that sad system is that the United States has an extraordinary group of Chinese activists with disabilities who were adopted, ironically, in the United States. I say that because millions of children with disabilities in China were forced into orphanages even though their parents were living. That is especially so when it was a one-child policy and parents wanted boys. And so girls with disabilities were put into orphanages even though their parents were living. Many of those children were adopted by American parents. If you look at the future of American disability movement, you will see many Chinese children who were adopted by American parents who are at the forefront of the American disability movement today. Think about the brain drain of all they lost in China with the millions of children who were told they couldn't go to school and were forced into orphanages taken away from their families. I want to sum up my comments by saying that my father was born or was a child in this city of Vienna. In 1939, the Nazis came to our house to my father because we are Jews. I am wearing a Jewish star. In the same city, Asperger, Dr. Asperger, experimented on children with autism, and many of those children were murdered. That is because people valued people with disabilities as being worthless, as being people we should throw aside. What we have seen with these three women are extraordinary talented individuals who represent the future of the 20% plus of the world's adult population that can unlock incredible talents, incredible solutions, and I cannot wait to see the world that these women will bring. Turning it over to Professor Johnson. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent reflection, Jennifer. Thank you so much, and with honor to your family and their time in Vienna. Um, I want to reach out to the members who are here and see if you have any questions for our experts in the field of disability advocacy for women with disabilities. Any questions from anyone? Okay, nobody has a question. I want to compliment all the men who came to this session. The people watching on video yes. can't see, but the majority yes. of the audience are men, and the men are taking up the entire front rows. <laughs> and I am just incredibly excited to see that. It's just wonderful to have you as allies. I told him to come. <laughs> Thank you, Hero. I appreciate that. We have a question in the back. Thank you, kind sir. Yeah, thank you for those words. Um, Edward Winter from World Vision. I'm just wondering um, what experience um, the panelists have had in terms of creating platforms for um, women and girls with disabilities in rural areas who um, may not have the same access to education and others, for them to be able to participate in a national level advocacy work. So, be interested to hear that. Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you. Any of our panelists want to respond to work that you're doing or work that you aspire to do with women and girls in rural areas? Please. Um, that's a great question, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, I, I've created something called the Asian Disability Network. We are a global online platform, however, we won't be reaching all of the people that we do need to reach, especially those without access to technology and internet and those in rural areas. So that is definitely our aim and hope. And I've had some amazing conversations at this conference on how we can perhaps make that happen. There are really unique challenges in reaching those people. Um, and 
this this is something that I just do off the side of my desk whenever I've got some time, so it's going to take some real thought. Um, but for those living in rural areas, we know that there are there's, there's higher prevalence of, of disability because of the lack of healthcare and infrastructure. So it's really important that we do put our efforts to reaching those people because nobody should be left behind just because of where they're born or whatever circumstances they might find themselves in. So I don't have an answer really, but we have hope and ambition. Thank you. Shaorang, have you given some thought to in, in the work, collaborative work that we're doing about women and girls in rural China, in Western China? A really good question. Um, we've been thinking about that a lot. Um, the deaf community sometimes doesn't have the technology that they need. Um, and especially people who are working on farms um, or in the rural areas, they have no way to contact other people. And it's a, a really big issue. Um, so we don't really know how to reach them. Um, they might just um, be married and have children and be working on a farm. And it's just a big issue that we need to solve. I'm, I'm not really sure exactly um, what we can do, but again, I think education is at the core of that um, and awareness. So I think those two things would be what's really going to make the difference. And I think I think this topic is going to show up more often for us, and, and we're going to delve into it deeper as time goes by. Thank you, Xiaorong. I know one of the things, areas that we're working collaboratively on is uh, securing funding for interpreter uh, education and certification in China. Currently, there are three highly quali or qualified interpreter education programs, uh, but we aspire to set one, uh, uh, start a new interpreter training program or education program in Western China and, and really work with that community. So it is a goal. We aren't there yet, but it is a goal. So identifying it as a goal is a good first step. It will take some time. But, uh, oh, sure. So I love your question. So in the United States, respectability has been working on fighting stigmas that limit people with disabilities. And one of the big problems is that people with disabilities are almost never shown in entertainment media. That we're, you know, 20% or more of the adult population, but it turns out that only 2% of the characters in media are people with disabilities. And when they are shown, they're shown as really sad. And sometimes the happy ending is that they die by suicide, right? Terrible, terrible portrayal of people with disabilities. Almost all the portrayal of disability is of white men who are cisgender. Almost no portrayal of females, almost no portrayal of people of color with disabilities. So respectability has a team and there are other organizations also working in the space, working with Disney and Netflix and Amazon and Warner Media and others. Um, Respectability's worked on over 300 productions in entertainment media. Most of them are not yet on screen because they're still in process. But the thing is that people watch entertainment media everywhere. So, for example, the show Born This Way, which shows seven young adults with Down syndrome, has been shown all over the world. Um, now on Madagascar, which is a cartoon there are, for children, there are characters that are deaf, and the characters, which are monkeys, the two monkeys who are brothers, actually are speaking to each other in actual sign language. Disney animators have now learned how to animate sign language, positive role modeling of the use of sign language for monkeys who are deaf for children's programming for four-year-olds. And so this is one way to communicate an inclusive future when there is an absence of special educators or perhaps direct programs because people often have, even in the most rural areas, access to a phone where they're watching educational content. Thank you. Excellent, and I know we have just about one minute left, and we're just honored to have this ability 
to host this panel through St. Cloud State Center. And I'd like to hand over the microphone. Fatma, could you share just some closing comments? A minute. Give us that power shot at the end. Um, just uh, as a wrap up of the session, I'd, I'd, um, I'd, say, I'd love to say one, one thing for uh, young disabled women who are watching uh, and for all of you who are here, uh, it's the, the, the road is, is long but we're getting there. And as long as we are working together as one and we have a, sh we have a shared vision, uh, we, can, we will get there. It's just the matter of treating this as a continuum instead of, instead of uh, um, individual attempts, I think. Okay, thank you. Closing comment uh, from Fatma at the USA Pavilion in Dubai. She made a statement and she said, you know, people often say we need to have a seat at the table. And then she said, but I don't like that. We need two seats at the table. <laughs> and I think they need more. The voices of young women, can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sharang. Sharang, thank you, we miss you. <laughs> okay. Oh, do you have time you have for one minute? more? Do you have a minute? Okay. Do we have time for a closing comment from Sharang? Okay, Sharang, please. Yes, I, I want to say to any women or girls who are disabled in the audience, um, I just want to say to them to be yourself and don't don't feel like you have any limitations. You know, be stand up for yourself and do what you want to do in the world. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Zero Project. We appreciate the opportunity.